Outrocast. I like your background. It's a nice room. <laughs> Thank you. It alternates between hoarding and uh, collecting. No, but uh, hey, thank you for taking the time, Harvey. Congratulations on this book. It's about six months old, but to me, it's pretty new. When did you actually finish it? Um, last, uh, probably September, something like that. Um, so you had to wait it, like six It went seven, out in England in March, and it went out in America in May. It's not that long. So you're dialing in from Palm Springs. You're still calling California home? Yeah, it's Rancho Mirage. Just, yeah. It's very nice. nice. It is nice. Uh, had you spent much time there before relocating to Palm Springs in that area? Um, I'm going to turn my phone completely off. I'm sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's going to start messing around. I'll just get it off. No problem, man. Right, okay. So um, we're talking about... My, I, I um, got a house here in 1990. And I was a snowbird for about 30 years or so. With COVID, we've not been back since then. So we got rid of our house in, uh, in England, where we always were in Altrincham, sort of suburb of Manchester, where I always live. And uh, we've not been back since, really. All our friends seem to be disappearing rapidly, and it's, uh, it's, it's very traumatic as you get older. <laughs> I can imagine. But the reason I ask about you relocating to California is New York and London are very similar music industries. It's a similar work ethic. It's a very what you see is what you get. Whereas Los Angeles is very, I don't know, you have to look for the hidden meaning. When somebody <laughs> says, let's do lunch, that means ne they never want to see you again. You la, have la, to learn la. that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, La La Land. <laughs> Exactly. So was it a big change for you to come out to California? I mean, finally, it stops raining, you know, beautiful weather, but it's not exactly oh. the easiest business for you. No, uh, but I, I was still living in Manchester, as I say. I only spent the winters here for, my, for 1990, and um, my career had developed quite considerably by 1990. Yeah. You could almost yeah. say at that stage, it probably thought it was going to be the twilight, you know. <laughs> it seems to have gone on. Um, no, uh, Anybody that's born in California will never know how lucky they are. They should have been born in Manchester and sat through a February of rain, more bronchitis and bronchial problems in the north of England. And in those days, on top of everything else, there was all the mines and the coal and the smoke for the factories. So pollution was, air pollution was phenomenal. And I, I made a vow to myself when I could, I'm never going to spend another February in England because everybody died in February apart from everything. Oh, my parents, Every, <laughs> February was a bad month for me. So I, I came here and I, the light is fantastic. If it rains, nobody really takes any notice. In fact, they all cheer and go outside and enjoy it. Whereas in Manchester, oh, not another bloody rainy day. You know? I mean, Manchester a bit like Seattle. You know, it's inundated yeah. with rain. Yeah. So I was very concerned about the weather and I think it's helped. Uh, me live longer in a way, certainly healthier, definitely from being sort of an outdoor life as opposed to shuttled up for four months in rain and fog and everything, you know. Yeah, some of my favorite bands ever are from Manchester, but they're all miserable bands, <laughs> making miserable music. And you wait to see when do they leave? <laughs> and the answer is they all left. Well, no, Lol said to me the best. I said, Oh, we lucky. I said to him about a few weeks ago. Aren't we lucky, you know, we we managed to, we lived through all that time. He says, yeah, and I was glad to get, and I was lucky to get out. <laughs> and that was his response. Exactly. So, <laughs> but I didn't feel that way because I was very secure in my own life and my family was very close and um, I liked it. And uh, I, I like not going to London because London is like going from here to LA. You know, you get stuck in the traffic and it's like a hassle every time. I mean... In America, it's no no better. I mean, we used to do trips from LA to San Diego. I mean, if you went on a Friday afternoon because you had a gig to do, it took us six hours. You know, it was just pathetic. You know, and that, and that's why we created everything around Manchester. We had our own agency in Manchester, we had recording studios in Manchester. Everything was Manchester, and had a good football team as well. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, well, one of the things that your book talks about is your transition into snooker-related management and promotions. Did you ever encounter any music people other than yourself within the snooker world? Um, well, they all came in afterwards, you know. I mean, it was all, when, once it became celebrity, it sort of transcended whether it was music, whether it was art, whether it was fashion. They were all celebrities, and then and then they and it attracted people, obviously like myself or any other impresarios who had any foresight. They try and open up them. They wouldn't just rely on the regular, straightforward music, you know. And, and I always wanted to expand into vast, vast areas that I thought would control comedy, which was controlled by Liverpool. For some reason, there was an agent in Liverpool. Of course, Liverpool was full of the Irish, and they had all the comedians. Ken Dard, Arthur Askey, going back yonks. It was always, um, always very heavily uh, inundated with comedians, mm -hmm. and of course it was it was a closed shop. Couldn't get in. Couldn't get a breath in. It's like a complete monopoly. Then I thought, right, I'll go into. Uh, and when I say I, I'm talking about our company. We'll go right. into classical music, and so there's a guy called Raymond Gabay. He controlled every single. I don't want to swear, concert there was, whether it was, you know, this orchestra, that orchestra, you couldn't get a smell. He had the whole thing sewn up, so that was gone. Then I thought, sport, yes, I got a footballer in the 60s, and um, a very good footballer, it was the England under-21 captain. I thought, mm -hmm. right, and he wanted to leave Manchester City at the time. And uh, I said, well, right, we'll go to Manchester United. So I phoned up Manchester United Football Club to say, I look, there's this kid, he's an England under 21 captain, he'd like to go to Manchester United. And they said, we're well, very sorry, we don't talk to managers. That was it. I thought, you bastards. Well, nowadays they pay, they talk to managers if the managers will talk to them. So, you know, yeah. it's kind of a whole. But in those days, everybody was exploited, whether it was the musicians, through ridiculous recording contracts, whether it was the footballers through ridiculous salaries or every, everything, it was kind of all organized. Nobody seemed to argue. I mean, you just, I didn't, once they said they weren't going to speak to me, I then went to another club, West Brom, and they had a manager called Ron Atkinson, who was very, a nice guy. And we did the deal in three hours. I mean, an England under 21 captain, you don't turn your back up unless you're Manchester United, you know. What do you do? Man, you still has that reputation all these years later. Do you... Oh, it's unbelievable what they're going through at the moment. And they lost one of the greatest players, which was Greenwood, who was found not guilty. But nevertheless, because of the slur and all the everything else, they got rid of him. I mean, the high, the high, the, well, in those days, Manchester United were the team. Every mm. single person that wanted to play football in England would want to play for Manchester United because of the the Busby Babes and the, everything that followed from it. It was just magic and it was, so they had the kind of monopoly. All the players wanted to go to them. You know, it wasn't money. You know, they go there for less money and then the things reversed round. And now Manchester United doesn't mean anything. Neither does Spurs, neither does Arsenal. There's a collection of individuals from all over the world that go under the banner, whatever they're playing under for the big green dollar. You could say the same about the New York Yankees in baseball. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You can say that about all the football teams in America because, you know, I mean, since I've been here, the San Diego Chargers have moved around. I don't know where they're ending up at the moment, you know, whether it's Las Vegas or LA or wherever they are. But it's, there's no, when I was a kid, you were either City fan or United fan, and you went to see that team. And that team were probably 30 or 40% from local lads trained through the local schools. And if you had a couple of foreign players, it was that was it. And nowadays, it's just totally... And that's why England haven't won the World Cup since 1966, because they're not the, it's not the same anymore. Right. Well, hey, back to your music career here. You worked with some of the top charting artists of all time. Herman's Herbert's is one of the biggest bands ever that people don't really think of as one of the biggest bands ever. You know, by that, I mean, they probably did sell more records than the Rolling Stones, more records than Led Zeppelin. Once you factor, factor in all the single sales, am I totally off about that? I'm not sure that's, that, that's correct, but I would say that, for instance, in 1965, they outsold the Beatles 
for the whole month of April. Uh, they kept help off number one for four weeks. I mean, they were enormous. In England, I started off with Herman's Hermits and all my friends were saying, oh, what are you wasting your time for? They're not very good. What, what are you wasting your time for? And they had a full date sheet, and then I got a record, and the record went to number one, I'm in something good. And they, they said, oh, it's a one-hit wonder. Get yourself a job. So the next record, Show Me Girl, was a disaster. And it shouldn't have been, but it was. It was another Goffin King number. And I thought, well, maybe they're right. But after 12 hits, they shut up. And, uh, but in that, never were they given the respect they deserved, maybe because they were regarded as a singles band, whereas Led Zeppelin was an albums band and Rolling Stones were fantastic on stuff. Rolling Stones and Beatles, were, they were amazing. The records were amazing. Well, our records were amazing, but it was a different, we, we had a different following. <laughs> the great analogy is, if a mother saw a Beatle come up the drive with a daughter, they think, well, these are the funny, don't like the look of that. The Rolling Stone came up with them and said, well, I'm going to get some cyanide immediately. I can't take this. But if Peter came up, chirpy, blue-eyed, Catholic, good-looking, friendly, boy next door, they'd be quite comfortable. So we, we were right in that market. and We weren't in the... In fact, they really weren't competing in a way. They were kind of... When we came in for the British invasion, everybody was kind of together against the garbage we'd been listening to for 30 years. Well, the, the reason I single out Led Zeppelin is I believe that history has been rewritten where Led Zeppelin technically in the U.S. only had one top 40 hit. A whole lot so of it's a the only top 40 hit here. And when I look at the album sales of Led Zeppelin, I don't think they had any diamond certified albums besides Led Zeppelin 4. But then if you look at the number of million sellers and multi-million sellers that Herman's Hermits had, it might be more than some of the bands that we think of as the all-time biggest bands it's just well the thing R. is I, is to do with celebrity again it's to do with i mean led zeppelin were an albums band also they had robert plant and there was an image terrific image yeah. and they were very popular and they were they, they, they were the they were bigger than you two i mean they were the biggest i mean they were just enormous so that that was that queen had freddie mercury you know, David Bowie, all these people were spectacular showmen, which 10CC didn't have. And Peter was very, very good, but we, we were never really... The reason we didn't happen in America was basically two things. One, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit confused. I, what, what, I'm sorry, we're talking, we're talking about 10CC, we're talking about, I'm getting, I'm crossing the I was, two. I was, uh, Herman's Hermits. Hermits. Yeah. Uh, Herman's Hermits and just about how how much they sold in their heyday which I think way outsold a lot of these bands who are album bands and that the Zeppelin sales were primarily in the 80s 90s and 2000s after the fact whereas Herman's Hermits was outselling everybody while they were together in the prime of the 60s yeah um, that's that's true I mean the Rolling Stones were very frustrated you know, we would we would sort of um, be in a hotel with them and all the kids outside would be shouting, Herman, 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 you know. <laughs> we did a date with the Rolling Stones. And um, when we got there, I mean, I've heard that we're, Andrew Logos and myself were reputed to have any fight or something. I don't think it was like that because I really, we both liked each other. But um, as to who should go on first, you know. And the thing is, 50% of the fans would have gone for the Rolling Stones and they wouldn't want to see Herman's Hermits fans or vice versa, but there was 50-50. And switching back to 10CC, when we did Nebworth with the Rolling Stones, maybe 1% went to see 10CC and 99% went to see the Rolling Stones. So it's slightly different. I mean, Herman's Hermits and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, boom, that, they took over America big time and covered, as I say, the boy next door, the rebel and the brilliant music, you know, chirpy, funny, brilliant people. I mean, all bands in their own right were tremendous. And I think the other reason why Herman Sermits didn't, that you're saying they had more sales, but they never had the, um, for, well, the following, maybe, even the following, but they had a following, but it wasn't as you, you, now you go and see a Rolling Stones concert, you might see the grandparents, the parents, the children, 
The right. Rolling Stones was a, oof, it was a sound, you know. I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's very tricky to, to see. You can't analyze everything. And everything relates to timing. You well, know, we were... where I'm going with all that is Herman's Hermits should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's one absolutely. Of the... It's absolutely embarrassing. They've got. It, I think they have actually got a window in the Hall of Fame. If you go into the museum, there's a whole window. And the fact that they're not there, it's just a joke. I mean, I suppose maybe they've not been really approached properly. And I'm going to, I'm going to try and do my best to, uh, as I. If the book does better and, and things go well, hopefully, I'll be able to help. And I think they should be in the Hall of Fame, just for the fact they were the third, big, second biggest band in the world at that time. Of course. Well, well, one more comment I have before I ask a last question to you. And that comment is, there's a 10cc lyric that I find myself saying two or three times a week. And that's, I don't like reggae. I, I love it. <laughs> that lyric. That was actually, uh, yeah, well, that was, that actually happened, I think. I'm not sure. I think it was Graham that so was in the West Indies or something, and he, he asked somebody that question, do you like cricket? And he said, no, I love it. And that was it. I and mean, then I think it came from that. And uh, we were very fond of the West Indies. I love Calypso. They had some great songs from that. And, you know, it was just, uh, that was our escape from the bitter cold of the 60s and 70s. Everybody went to the West Indies if they could afford it. So, Christmas right. sort of thing, and everybody was into that culture. Yeah. Well, my last question is starts off as a compliment before it goes into the question, and that's <laughs> I consider you one of the all time greats of artist management in the music industry. I think that when you look at the people who had decades of success and continually rubbed elbows with the geniuses, you know, there's you and Shep Gordon and David Krebs and a lot of people who were able to make it 40, 50 years and then also have success outside of music as well, which shows that you know what you're doing. So this book is out. What are you working on right now that the book is out or is or are you just coasting and taking it easy while you can? I'm certainly not coasting. That, that I can promise you. I am promoting the hell out of this book. I'm doing interviews daily. Um, I'm also recapturing the history. People are writing to me from 60 years ago saying, we did this, we do that. I'm getting all the facts together. And it's my intention. I hope there's going to be another... I don't know if they call it a second edition or a paperback or something comes up and there's going to be a load more stuff in. I mean, stuff which is really interesting with Herman and the, the Herman and the Hermits was the band that I signed originally. We changed it to Herman's Hermits when we had our first record. But that Herman and the Hermits has a history which is fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating about me. I'll just tell you one thing. There was a program called Seen at 6.30, which is a TV program in England. And there's a very, very brilliant producer called Johnny Hamm, probably the first person to put the Beatles on, on, this pre on TV in England. He was just a genius. And I tried to get him. I was working as an accountant in the office, and I always trying to get through to him. And it was like, get through to Granada TV. It was not easy. So I thought, right, I'm going down at lunchtime. I went down, and I went to, I said, can I see Johnny Hamm? I want to see Johnny Hamm. And he said, oh, he's in Studio 3. I thought, what the hell's that? That's the pub across the road. That was, so I go into the pub and uh, Johnny Hamp's there with another guy having a drink. So you, Johnny Hamp, yeah, I'm Harvey Lisberg. I've sent you a photograph of the, oh yeah, hi Harvey, you know, Herman the Hermits. Yeah, they look, they look quite good. I said, you must come and see them. He said, yeah, well, we'll come and see them sometime. When would you think? And I said, how about now? So but he was so shocked. I said, what do you mean now? So well, they're playing at the Plaza Borum at lunchtime show. Would you like to come and have a look at them now? So we went to see them there, and he and the other guy, they were diabolical, they were practical jokers. They said, whatever happens, don't show any emotion. Don't pretend you like them. Just keep a dead straight face through the whole show. And I'm sitting at the table with them, the band are there, the girls are going berserk, and they're sitting there like two lead faces. Oh, God, they obviously don't like this. And they didn't say a word when it finished. So I said, well, did you like them? And so be at the studio at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> that was it. So it's like you said, you don't like it, you love it. Just like the 10cc record lyric right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, Harvey, hey, thank you for your time. Congratulations on this book. Looking forward to the uh, the extended version of the book and you preserving the history. So thank you on all ends and looking forward to what's to come. It's very nice talking to you and always do it anytime you like. Outro cast. <laughs>